the labor session. Uh, this presentation is about building successful teams by Max Klepper. Max currently manages a 7,500 sow farm at Iowa Select Farms. He's managed that farm. Uh, he's managed farms ranging from 4,200 to 7,500 sows while leading a team of 18 employees. Prior to Iowa Select, Max attended Iowa State University and worked in several research facilities within the university. I've had the pleasure uh, of working with various species of animals, including companion and production livestock, and also has had the opportunity to take part in research with the USDA and Mayo Clinic and Cardiovascular Laboratories. Let's uh, join me in welcoming Max, please. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I uh, hope you're enjoying Iowa Swine Day. This is actually my first time attending, and, and I've uh, been enjoying it so far. Um, so like Will said, I'm, I'm Max Klepper. Uh, I, I manage a sow farm up in northwest Iowa. Uh, it's 7,500 head, a team of 18 people. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking about uh, building that successful team and the culture on a sow farm and, and any workplace. So a little background about myself. Um, I graduated from Iowa State in 2016 with my bachelor's in animal sciences. Uh, shortly after graduating, I took a position with Iowa Select Farms, uh, just as an animal caretaker up near Iowa Falls. Um, and <clears throat> about a year and a half after I had taken this position with the farm, I had managed to make my way up into my first leadership role. Uh, I took a position as the farrowing department head. Uh, I managed that farrowing department for about six months, uh, and then I had an opportunity to manage the entire farm. So I graciously accepted, uh, and I... Uh, uh, sorry. Um, so I took that position as the, the sow farm manager. I had managed the farm for about three months, uh, and then my sow supervisor showed up on farm, and he's telling me about this new farm they're building up in northwest Iowa. It's going to be a 7,500 head sow farm, 18 employees, and it's a tour farm, so it's even that much more unique. I told him I'd think about it. I went home and I slept on it. Uh, I didn't really think too much of it. It couldn't be that hard. I'd, I'd been managing for all of one quarter now, and, and we were a top five farm that quarter, so of course I pretty well had it down. Um, and I couldn't have been any further incorrect, so going to this new farm was, was a huge challenge. Uh, I managed six more people, which didn't sound like much, but the thing I underestimated was the fact that I left a team that was established, uh, a very successful team already, uh, to go to a new farm with new staff, most that were new to the swine industry to begin with. And, and that was a huge challenge. One thing that did save me was, uh, I, I, as I started the position as South Farm Manager, I was enrolled in a program. It's called our People Care Leadership Program. And so this is a, a program that's designed to help new leaders, young leaders, continue to grow, develop a mindset or skill set to lead themselves or be successful at leading others. Uh, and this was one of the things that helped me the most uh, in my transition from this successful farm that I'm already at to this new farm that honestly started out as a bit of a shit show. <laughs> so before we dig into some of those concepts or principles that, that had helped me uh, in that journey, I wanted to talk about some of the issues that we're actually seeing in the workforce today. So uh, the biggest one, uh, COVID, the pandemic, that one uh, was a huge strain on our teams. I don't think there's probably anybody in this room that could say they made it all the way through the pandemic without feeling some kind of pressure or or some kind of strain on their teams or their workforce. Following the pandemic, we had what some are calling the great resignation. You know, people were, were leaving their jobs. They were looking for better pay, you know, better working conditions, maybe a better leader. And not necessarily just quitting our jobs to not work, they just wanted to find better work. So this was very important for leaders. You know, we need good leaders to keep our staff at, at a time like this. And on top of all these issues, we just have a dwindling interest in agriculture. Nowadays, we have, we have a lot of kids that are leaving the family farm, and they're not looking back. They're not going back to farming. So getting people into agriculture is tough, but when we get people into agriculture, we need to keep them there. You know, we want to keep them on our teams and, and make them successful. So some key concepts uh, that I'm going to share and talk about today are, are some things that I focused on in our journey, you know, as I left that that successful team and started on my new team. Uh, these were some of the things that we had really focused on as a team um, to get to where we can consider ourselves successful. And those are communication, you know, people care, caring for our people and, and their values, 
and then just some leadership traits that had helped me evolve and grow. So I'm sure we've all heard it before, you know, communication, communication, communication. You know, communication is key. It's vital for my team and I. Every morning we'll sit down and, and we'll communicate the game plan for the day. Uh, if we have good communication for the day, we're probably going to have a smooth, efficient day. We might have issues arise, but we can still mitigate the impact of those, you know, maybe not let them ruin our day. The opposite can be said if we go into the day with poor communication. If we start the day with, with poor communication, even a, a minor issue might really throw a dent in our day. And as, is, as important it is for communication between my team and I, it's just as important between my team. So at my farm, we have two different departments. We have breeding and farrowing, but between the two, two departments, we're still one team. So we need to be on the same page at all times. You know, that, that communication needs to be constant between the two departments and it needs to be concise so we can make sure we're staying efficient. <clears throat> so along with communication, uh, I kind of loop in organization. So the more we communicate, the more organized we can be. A principle that we, had, we like to use um, is, is the big rock, small rocks principle. So if you imagine you have this mason jar in front of you and you know, a handful of rocks, that mason jar would represent our day, you know, what, what we can get into our day, and the rocks would represent our tasks for the day. So the bigger the rock, the bigger the task. You know, the smaller rocks might be a miscellaneous task. So every morning, my team and I will sit down and, and we'll plan out the big rocks, the small rocks. So the big rocks being the pillars of our day, you know, the, the weaning process. Maybe we're getting gilts in that day, um, maybe sending coals out, maybe just washing the room. Those are all big parts of our day, the pillars of our day, and we want to make sure we focus our time and efforts on those and make sure we're addressing those right off the bat. As well as communication, feedback is very important in terms of communication. Uh, so feedback can have a couple different forms, you know, positive feedback and negative feedback. Throughout the day, I'll routinely try to give out positive feedback to my employees, you know, tell them good jobs on the things that they've been doing, that recognition is, is important in their morale. But not everything is, is going to be positive feedback. There's going to be times where there's, there's negative feedback. And if I can, I'll still try to find a way to make that negative feedback positive. So if I have an employee that, say he's washing slow and I want him to wash faster, well, I might find something positive to say here in that instance or in that conversation and say, oh, hey, Jack, you know, your crates look really clean. You did a great job there. But one thing I'd like to work on is the speed, you know, the pace at which we get it done. You know, I go into the conversation with something positive and they're going to take that conversation a lot better, even if it does have some negative uh, aspects to it. And not all times can you find something positive to say. If I have an employee that no calls or doesn't call or doesn't show up, you know, I'm probably not going to say a whole lot of positive things in that conversation. But the important thing here is to not avoid it. You know, I'm probably as guilty as anybody else at avoiding those tough conversations. Um, through trial and error, I found out that you're best off just facing it head on. You know, if, if you avoid that conversation once, you know, that, that issue is going to happen again. So if I can address it right off the bat, even if I'm not entirely sure how I want to address it, it's best to sit down and just talk about it. You know, I'm going to say the, the issue, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll make, it a, make a correction right then and there before it happens again and again, and then now we're really flustered about it. And with any kind of communication, you know, we expect active listening you know, through the team and myself included. So if my team is, is bringing me issues and I'm not actively listening, they're not going to bring me issues anymore. And if I'm talking to my team and they're not actively listening, then it's, it makes it hard. It makes you flustered. So you expect active listening, and you're going to get that active listening if you're actively listening to your team as well. So the next important principle or concept uh, it revolves around people care. And I have this broken down into a few different categories. You know, respect, you know, respecting our employees, their values, their cultures. Emotional intelligence, understanding our employees and what drives them, and then training. You know, how do we go and train that employee to make them be successful and beneficial to our teams? So first off with respect, you know, we like to say that our employees start with our respect. They don't necessarily need to come in and earn our respect, 
because they're going to start with our respect on, on the very first day. And that makes our employees feel that much more comfortable. They don't need to go in and compete or go in and try to prove themselves. They can go in and just learn, you know, and get to know what their team is or what, what's value or what our values are. I'm going to talk about a couple of different principles that we went through in, in our People Care Leadership Program. First one being hosting guests, you know, being a relational leader. Next would be social currency or earning respect tokens. And lastly would be the velvet covered brick. So the first principle would be hosts and guests, you know, being a good host uh, for my team. So if I'm hosting a party and, and my guests would be my employees, I want to make their time enjoyable here. I want to be relational as a leader or as a host. So very first would be initiating contact. So this starts with our new employees. You know, when we have a new employee show up to the farm, the first thing we want to do is, is we want to make them feel welcome, make them feel comfortable. So my very first day on the sow farm, I got to the farm, I showered in, you know, no one really helped me through, um, but I got to the table and, and I sat down and I'm waiting for my name to be called for the tasks. And my name never got called, but I sat there and lingered after the, the conversation in the morning. And he said, oh, you're going to go follow Jack around. You know, we're going to go do some maintenance stuff. And, and that was what I remember from my first day. So that's vastly different than how we treat employees today. So, and a new employee shows up on my farm today and, and we'll greet them right at the front door. You know, we'll help them get across the bench. We'll get them into the, the shower that they're going to shower in. And then once they get out, you know, find them the clothes that fit them, get them to the table. And as soon as we have everybody there, the first thing we do is we do introductions. Everyone's going to say, you know, their name, what department they're in, something they like to do for fun. And that, that starts building a connection, which is going to bring us to our next point, you know, connecting, finding what we have in common. And there's another principle with, with our connections is the 101% principle. So we might not have everything in common with, with an employee or other staff members, but once we find that one thing we have in common, we want to give 100% to it. You know, it might not have everything in common with, with some of my employees, but say I have an employee that likes to go fishing. Well, that's, that's something to talk about. So Monday morning, I might say, hey, Nick, did you do any fishing this weekend? And, and that's something we'll talk about. You know, we're building that connection, that trust, that relationship right off the bat. Next would be providing. You know, for, for uh, providing for my employees, I want to share support, wisdom, some past experiences. If I'm a host and, and I'm providing for my, my guests, you know, maybe I'm providing the cold beer and the food and the, the events for the night. So for employees, I'm, I'm consistently showing support, you know, sharing my wisdom, my past experiences, things that can help them be successful. And lastly, with the host and guest principle, it would be directing. So if I'm hosting a party, I want to direct the evening. I'm going to say, hey, we're going to eat supper at 5. Following that, you know, we're going to play some Monopoly. And, and then after that, we're going to have a bonfire for the night. So being at a, a south farm, you know, sharing uh, that direction might be, you know, pointing them in the right direction. I don't want to necessarily give them all the answers. But I want to give them the tools that they can use so that they can problem solve on their own. You know, some resources that they can utilize so that they can be successful. So I have a, a little story with this one. Um, I had been maybe two months into my, my manager position. And I had an employee that he was a little off for the day. And, and um, he asked me if we could talk after work. He, he had an issue that he wanted to address. And I said, sure. So, he comes up to me and, and uh, we're sitting in the office after work and he says, hey Max, my, my daughter's pregnant and I don't know how to feel about it. And I thought, I'm probably the wrong guy for this conversation. I'm 25, I've never been married, I'm single and I've never had kids, so uh, kind of SOL here. But um, I sat down and we talked and, and I tried to provide what kind of support and, and knowledge I had, which was you know, very little. Uh, but we get done with the conversation and, and I noticed that, you know, he, he seemed like he was in a better place but maybe didn't have all of his questions answered. So we have a, a program that our employees can access. It's called the Employee uh, Assistance Program. So I gave him the number for this and I said, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I probably didn't answer all your questions, you know, about your daughter and, and having a child. Why don't you call this number and, and see if they can give you any better advice? You know, I, I tried to provo provide the support that I could. 
Um, but at the end of the day, I knew that, that he needed a better direction than what I could provide. So I tried to provide him with the better resources and tools uh, and so he can make that decision or feel better about the decisions that are being made. So next with respects would be social currency. So I'm sure we've all heard of, of people earning a token of respect or uh, something along these lines. Um, so this is very important, you know, earning that respect throughout the day. Um, and we can do this in a couple different ways. You know, we can earn tokens of respect by, by making good decisions, you know, doing things right by our employees, being a good leader. We can also lose tokens of respect by doing the opposite, for doing wrong by our employees, making poor decisions, you know, not putting our employees first or, or their beliefs. And we can earn these respect tokens on and off the field. So uh, I'm on the field, you know, I might be making or earning these respect tokens by making good decisions and, and doing right by my people. But I've also earned respect tokens off the field, you know, in people's personal lives. I've helped uh, employees look at cars, look at housing, you know, do some things that aren't necessarily uh, at work or my responsibility, but it does help in earning that social currency or those respect tokens. And then that transfers over. I can use those at work. You know, I've earned that, re that employee's respect outside of work, and then that transfers over. So that employee is going to trust me or respect me that much more inside of work. The next principle with respect would be the velvet covered brick. So imagine you will, uh, a brick that's just wrapped in velvet. So it's, it's soft to the touch, but still solid, firm, you know, and that, that would be what we want to be as leaders. We can be firm on our values, but still have a little bit of wiggle room or a little bit of leniency. So early in my career, I was probably more velvet than brick. If someone said, hey, I want to take the week off. I'd be like, sure, cool. Um, and at the new farm, you know, I realized that being too velvety didn't work, so we were going to be more brickish. And, that didn't work either, you know. Employees said, hey, can I take tomorrow off? It's absolutely not. That doesn't work. We need to find a, a, a medium there. We need to be compassionate at times. So I have an example here. I had a, an employee that had been planning a, a trip all summer. He was going to go go home to Mexico. Um, and due to some unfortunate circumstances, his trip got canceled. So he had been saving these PTO days that, that were near expiration, and he said, Hey Max, you know I, I have this PTO day that now I'm not going to use due to my vacation being canceled. You know, can I use it tomorrow? And, and as much as it sucked to tell him no, I, I had to tell him no. I said no. You know, I would love to have you have the day off tomorrow, but I cannot do that. You know, we have a busy week, busy day. Um, we had a tour coming up. We had guilt showing up, and I just couldn't afford to. You know, give that employee the day off. He said, "What about tomorrow?" I said, "I would love to." You know. Uh, but then again, we also had employees gone that day. We had two or three people that were planning on being gone that day. So I said, you know, that day is going to expire tomorrow, but we'll get something figured out. Let me go home and sleep on it. Um, so I went home and thought about it and, and um, came back the next day and I said, okay, you know, we need to pull a little leniency. I'm going to be compassionate because you just lost, you know, the entire vacation that you've been planning on. Um, so I made a deal with him. I told him, you know, I'll let you take that day off, put you down on payroll. Make sure you don't tell my payroll department this. Um, but I told them, hey, okay, you know, we'll, we'll pull a little sneaky here. I'll put you down as being on vacation, and I'll let you use it the very following week on Tuesday. You know, it'll be a slower day, no guilts, nothing like that. And so it was this instance with, where I saved some of those respect tokens or some of that social currency. You know, I, I still could have told him no and said, hey, your vacation day is going to expire, and that would have just left him you know, troubled. He would have been upset about it. But I could work with him a little bit, you know. If he takes it on Friday or Tuesday, either way, you know, I, I think it's better to be a little compassionate in, at times like this, because then we can keep our employees' respect and trust. <clears throat> so next would be emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence to me is understanding that each employee is unique. You know, each one is driven by something different. Their motivation might be different. You know, their incentive is going to be different. And as a leader, you know, we need to figure out what that employee is motivated by, what that incentive is. And that emotional intelligence will allow us to motivate our entire team to reach those goals, targets. 
And once we've used emotional intelligence to figure out what we can use for an incentive or what motivates our team, then we can go from there. So I had a, a couple programs that I've started in my time as, as a manager. My first one was a gold star program. So at my very first farm, we were, we were battling some staffing issues. Um, so we still have you know, X, Y, and Z to get done, but we have less employees to do so. But the employees that stepped up, went above and beyond, we'd get a gold star. So that alone, you know, that recognition alone was motivating for a lot of my employees. They'd be able to point at the wall and say, hey, look how many gold stars I have. You know, it, it wasn't much. It was, it, if you got your 10 gold stars, you got a prize, you know, under $20. But that recognition alone was motivating for those employees. And those employees that did go above and beyond, you know, I had to have employees that would say, hey, Max, I'll, I'll stay late and power wash this room today. Okay, well, if you do that, gold star. It works out pretty well. Another program I used um, when we started our new farm, we really had an issue with attendance. So I thought, hey, what, what can we do to get people involved? You know, get people to show up, be on time, plan their, their absences. So I had a, a, not a, a lot of new employees that were still battling the, the attendance stuff. So what we did is we, we said, all right, we're gonna come up with a program. You know, if, if you're tardy, you're gonna get two points. If you call in and you say, hey, I'm not coming in today and it's an unplanned absence, you're gonna get four points. But if you had a planned absence, it was only one point. So an absence, you know, is a lot easier if it's planned. So I can build a schedule around a planned absence. But an unplanned absence is, is awfully hard to deal with. So early in that, that program, my employees started realizing, okay, well, planned absences only get me one point, so it makes it easy to just say, okay, you know, I'm gonna be gone next Thursday. That, that definitely helped uh, with our attendance issue. So the, the very first quarter, I said, at the end of the quarter, we'll tally up everyone's points and I'll pay out some cash for everybody who's got X, Y, or Z points. You know, you had to have a certain level of points to qualify. So those with poor attendance obviously didn't get any cash, but those with good attendance, they did get cash at the end of the quarter. And I, I paid out you know, several hundred dollars after the first quarter of this attendance program. The next quarter, I um, made it even tougher. I said, all right, you know, we're gonna do the attendance program again, um, but you have to beat me in competition. So your, your attendance would have to be better than my attendance. And I still had several employees that beat me in attendance that quarter. So as a whole, we were, our attendance was getting better. And I had uh, actually several employees that had better attendance than myself that, that quarter. So I, I paid out another several hundred dollars that quarter. And, and actually, we ended up stopping with that program that quarter. Um, by the end of that quarter, we had almost relatively no attendance issues. So it was a simple program. You know, it, it didn't take a whole lot. Um, and it was easy to, to correct the attendance issue. And as far as motivation goes, you know, outside activities can be extra motivating. So taking employees out to dinner. I've taken employees bowling or taking them to go kayak or tube down the river, stuff like that in, in their personal lives. Um, and they enjoy it. But I've put, you know, we gotta be cautious on how much we wanna be involved in an employee's life outside of work. So if an employee invites me out to dinner, just me, I'm probably gonna say no. You know, if I wanna invite everyone to dinner, that's one thing. but I don't want to play favoritism. I don't want any animosity between employees. You know, I don't want an employee to say, oh, well, he's just sucking up to the manager. So I want to be cautious at, at how much I want to be involved in their life. So once we've found that training or, or found that incentive and motivation for our employees, it makes it easier to figure out how we want to train that employee. So we want to find out the employee's strengths and they're true reasons for taking a position. You know, some employees take a position because they want to grow. They want to they do great in the swine industry. And sometimes we have employees that are just there for a paycheck. That doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad employee. It just means this might not be their calling. But for a successful team, you're going to have people like that, and you want them to still be successful or efficient. So for my hungry employees or the people that want to grow, I want to set targets and goals for them, challenge them weekly, routinely. For employees that aren't necessarily driven, you know, to grow within the company or, or are maybe just there for a paycheck, I still want them to be valuable. I still might set some goals and targets for them, 
but more than likely I want to find just a niche for them to fill. You know, I, I'm, I've had employees that I wouldn't say are necessarily big animal type people, but maybe they're better, you know, in a, in a mechanical kind of way or a maintenance type way. So I found a niche for that employee and said, okay, you know, we're going to kind of keep you away from the animal type stuff, but we have a, a need for, for maintenance on the farm. You can fill that need, whether it be fixing water lines or replacing water trees, uh, fixing farrowing crates, stuff along those lines. So if we can find a niche for those employees, they can still be beneficial. They can still be successful and still be a relatively useful person for that team or a part of that team. Cross-training is another important aspect of training. I think through COVID, I had learned a hard lesson, you know, that, that we didn't have enough cross-training done. We wanted to, to train more employees in farrowing and breeding and, and vice versa to give us a little more flexibility. You know, COVID happened and, and now we have a key individual or two that might be out for a week, two weeks. And that, that leaves you kind of high and dry there especially if that's a tough role to fill. So after COVID hit, we were very big on cross training, you know, getting employees trained in almost every aspect of the farm. So if we do have an employee out, we have options. So next, what I'd like to talk about is some leadership traits, some things that I found had helped me uh, create this team. Um, so attitude is a huge one and probably the most important, in, in my opinion, as far as leadership traits. Adapting to change, being able to paint a big picture, and just be confident. So attitude, I have uh, the thermostat and thermometer principle up here. So I think we all know what a thermometer is. You know, it, it reads the temperature. The thermostat would be what sets the temperature or sets the pace. So as a leader, we want to be that thermostat. We want to go into the day and be able to say, hey, I set the pace or I'm going to set the mood, the mentality for the day. You know, as leaders, we don't want to go into the day as a thermometer and just say, hey, we're just going to kind of go with the, go with the flow here today. So with attitude, we want to be positive and we want to be realistic in our goals and our targets. You know, we can be positive and say, hey, I, I think we want to... Um, get done at noon today, but we need to be realistic. So if, if I know that I'm probably gonna be done at four, that's gonna be a bad decision. I'm gonna lose some respect tokens when I say, hey, employees, we're gonna be done at 11 today, and then we get done at four, I'm gonna lose a lot of that respect. So being positive is very important. You know, I wanna be positive as often as I can in my, in my role, but I don't wanna be too overly positive in which I lose that respect. And over and above all, you know, we want to avoid a negative mindset because negative mindsets, they're, they're pretty contagious as well. You know, it's easy to spread that negative mentality across the farm, especially if it's possessed by your leader. And this can be done through mirroring. So mirroring uh, is very important to me and especially around new employees because, you know, a new employees doesn't necessarily know any better. They're going to do what they see. The, the, uh, behaviors they observe are, are going to be their behaviors. So I'm sure a lot of you have children, um, but one thing we always try to be around children is a positive role model or positive, um, you know, aspect of their lives. Because we know that that one time that we, we let a curse word out, that's going to be a new core memory for them. They're never going to forget that. So we want to be that positive example for our employees at all times. Adapting to change. So that's another important aspect for me. You know, we've, I've uh, went through a lot of changes in my six years with the company. But adapting to change, being able to say, hey, I'm going to be able to adapt to that day-to-day -day change or the changes in a week-to-week. -week. Um, especially as, as a whole, the swine industry changes and evolves quite a bit. In the six years that I've been in the industry, I've seen a lot of changes and, and evolutions in, in this industry. In a successful team, You'll need to be able to adapt and change with the times. You know, those that have trouble adapting or, or evolving typically get left. Next would be confidence. So being confident is very important. You know, I, I want to go into every decision 
be with a confident decision. I might even make the wrong decision, but if I do so confidently, I still probably be able to get my team to follow me. You know, so if I'm making those right decisions, I'm probably earning that respect token or those, those uh, social currencies that I can use. And if I make a wrong decision, well, I just need to take ownership of that. I need to say, hey, I've, I made the wrong decision. I stand by that. You know, I'm going to try to learn and get better from this. And another important aspect of confidence is confidence in your teams, if, you know, empowering your employees. If I can believe in my employees as much as some of the leadership em uh, empowers me, you know, I can only imagine the goals and targets that they'll be able to reach. Next would be the bigger picture. So as the leader, you know, you're the one with the vision for your team or your goal. And we want to be able to paint that picture for our team. You know, we might only do so in small steps. You know, in the last year, we've made a, a big change in mortality at my farm. You know, we've, we've dropped mortality almost 6 7%. So now if I, a year ago, said, hey, I want to I wanna drop mortality 7% in the next year, I don't think it'd happen. I think my team would say, hey, you're on crack. That's not going to happen. But if I say, hey, you know, we're at 17%, maybe we can get to 15%. That's doable. You know, I can do it in small increments and get the team to buy into that, believe in that. And so the next thing I have here is um, these gears. So another principle we talked about is called sprockets or small sprockets. So if I'm this middle sprocket here, you know, I, you might notice I'm not touching every gear here. But if I'm touching these gears and I start spinning, they're going to start spinning too. And so I'd like to say, okay, well, if I start spinning towards the goal or our vision, and then say these are my two department heads, then they start spinning towards our goal and our vision. And then my two department heads can get their teams going and spinning towards the goal and the vision. And so I don't necessarily need to go and train every employee to be the absolute best. Say I just train a couple people, my couple department heads, and say this is exactly how I want you to train everybody else. And then they can start spinning people towards our goal and our picture or our, our greater picture. So next is culture. You know, what is culture? How do you even create a culture? So to me, the culture is the norm. You know, it's, it's your, your normal habits, your, your employees' normal tendencies, and that's established by living and doing it every single day. You know, we got to have an emphasis on what's important to me or our teams, and it needs to be reinforced every single day, 365 days a year. So if I want a, a culture of safety on my farm, I want to sit down and talk about safety every day. You know, if I observe people doing safe things, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reinforce that with some positive feedback. I want to recognize the importance of safety every single day, maybe just a couple minutes here and there. And then I've got a culture. People start believing in that because we talk about it every day, all the time. So if I want to have a culture of doing the right thing, it's, it's the same thing. You know, I need to do the right thing every single day. I can't do the right thing five days a week and then on the weekend say, okay, well, did most of the stuff right. You know, I need to do the right stuff even on, an, on Christmas Eve when you're at the farm and you're trying to get a pit unstuck. You know, it's still doing the right thing every day. Your employees see that and they can buy into it because they can say, hey, I saw my leader do that. You know, I can do that. So a recap, you know, <clears throat> Building a successful team or culture in the workplace is, is easier when there's an emphasis on communication, respect, you know, continual growth as a leader, and people care as a whole. And I think you know, the continual growth is very important for our teams, especially our leaders. You know, we have to do things that are outside of our comfort zone. You know, for example, I'm not going to lie, I'm terrified of public speaking, but here I am today. Um, I know in doing so that I can make myself better and, and continue to help make my team better. And then a lot of times in the swine industry, we hear, take care of the pigs and they will take care of you. And I'd like to challenge each and every one of you to say, you know, can you do that for your team? If you take care of your team, I'd like to say that they'll take care of you too. And that's all I have for you here. I, I got some time for some questions. Please join me in thanking Max. I think we've got about five minutes for questions, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll come bring the mic to you and, and you can ask. 
Max, I actually have one question for you. So you talked about finding the strengths and how each of your individual employees works. Do you think that's better done in the barn while doing a task with them or like sitting down in the office and, and kind of going about it that way? Which do you prefer? Um, I would say a little bit of both. I'm more of a, a hands-on type person. So most of the strengths I go and find out is usually by obser observing in the barn or being a part of that process in the barn. Um, but yeah, I would say a good chunk of, of what I figure out of an employee is, is actually looking at their work, you know, following them about their work to see, okay, you know, is this done right? Is it done, need a little improvement? Something along those lines. Max, can you share any insights on your onboarding process of new employees, kind of how that structure looks, and then also um, e employee fee evaluations? Is it annual, quarterly, monthly? How do you do employee sure. feedback on evaluation? So our, our employees are brought in, and they'll go through an orientation program with the company for about a few days. Um, and then our, our review process, you know, uh, they'll get a review 30 days after entering the farm, you know, 60 days after entering the farm, and then 90 days after entering the farm. And then after that period, they'll, they'll be reviewed annually. Um, but reviews don't necessarily have to be an annual type thing. You know, it's, it's often nice to s sit down and maybe just do a brief review on, on things that you're seeing an employee do well or, or things that you think an employee needs to improve on. We've got time for one more quick question, if anybody has one more. I know the front row said they were going to contribute and haven't yet. All right, with no more questions, let's go ahead and thank our speaker one more time.